everyone for being here, especially the panelists for their time today. And I'm excited about this panel. You know, we have a lot of different perspectives that I think all the panelists will bring. We've got some international perspective. We've got some software perspective. So I think it'll be a very good panel. Um, so let's jump in. A lot to cover. And, and I think I want to start here with the U.S. end market. Um, because it seems like a lot of the challenges in the higher ed space have gotten more pronounced as we look back over the last three to five years, especially around enrollment. So, you know, would be curious in your view, what do universities need to do to ensure that they remain relevant and to improve the value of a degree? Um, and I, maybe I'll start with you, Steve, since you are sitting next to me. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm right. going to start with Laura because See, she did. That backfired on me, did I? I knew it. I was like, sit there, you get the first question, yeah. right? So it backfired, though. Um, I, I would say, first of all, there's just a, there's so much that higher education has to focus on now because the, because of the transformation in the U.S., the demographics, there's an enrollment cliff coming in a couple of years. I think many start to feel it. And um, I think the most important thing is to step back and say, why are we here? We're here for student success, putting students first. And as many institutions are ramping up and digi digitizing everything, they need to think about like, what are the outcomes or what do we need to focus on um, to make sure that they're taking care of students. Students and parents are asking, what's the value of a degree at a time that's really exciting because many other opportunities for learning are coming in with credentials and, non and micro credentials, different programs offered from um, big tech companies like Google and Microsoft. So how do you actually focus and harness the value for students and put that at the center? That's incredibly important. Um, so, you know, what do they need to do? They need to get a strategy and a plan. They need to tie their, uh, as a software company, their technology strategy to outcomes of what are they trying to achieve. They need to open up to say there are new types of learners and nurture learners to come back. So all the reskilling we see and the, a little bit of panic around AI and what's that going to mean for education, they have to really take that up the, the, to the next level, rely on their technology partners. Um, and and really be able to articulate the value of their institution, their differentiation to their students because students are questioning. Um, also onboarding new um, programmatic changes that may help students get their certification degrees faster so you're not just in a traditional cycle every single day. Can, uh, let me just add a little color to that as well, is that, you know, the, the universities that we work with, I, I'm, I'm really bullish on the higher ed system and its ability to, to um, make this transition. Um, I think, and the ones that I see are, that are most successful right now are the ones that are really focused on what Laura was talking about, was they're, they, think of it as the learner and the path that the learner is going to take to the university is very different than it has in the past, right? It used to be, you know, when I graduated, I knew I was going to graduate high school, I was going to go get my degree, I was going to go get a job or go to grad grad school. But now that that path is so much much more different. And, and so when you start to think about it that way, you don't necessarily have to think about, well, my whole world is getting thrown up, in, in you know, and, and and I have to rethink everything. But I do have to start thinking about okay, this has to be uh, an omni-channel delivery, right? I have to be able to address that student that wants to come and matriculate for four years or the one that wants to come for a little bit and then, you know, has to stay at home and, and work because, you know, somebody in the family got sick and still be able to receive education. And, and when you start thinking about it that way, it's not, um, it's not this big, scary, um, you know, existential threat anymore. It's more of, I just got to think a little bit different about how I'm going to be delivering and, and um on my mission, which is to reach learners, right? Not just the ones that are coming from high school for four years. And, and Steve, you you run the LMS. Mm -hmm. We're the ERP Student Information System. We said we we need to do a better job to partner to to surface up the data. I think the biggest challenges for change are institutions. Many run blind. They don't have access to all the data to make the best decisions. So, as as we we um, fifty percent of all the institutions run on our ERP SIS and they're moving to SAS, once they get there, you can unlock all that data. We have an open interoperable platform, so all that data can come together in persona-based experiences through a Lucian experience. And, and it's not about getting to cloud and SAS, but it's actually then activating the data 
And then what's happening now is we're just building AI into everything. So administrative processes and enrollment, better experience for the administration and students. So that, that's where, where can we take the burden and the pressure off institutions to be more productive so they can focus on students. 70% of students say they have anxiety or depression. Their financial aid, financial questions, the, the, the price of a degree is going up at all levels. So it's really just having a very focused strategy and plan and making sure that your business strategy is tied to your technology strategy. And that's where many innovative companies sitting in the room, you are gonna add so much more value when you can be part of that the, the holistic data strategy of, a, of an institution, because right now it's the biggest barrier to where they need to go for the future. And, and maybe maybe focusing that concept a little bit more and thinking about the importance of catering to non-traditional students. Um, you know, I think the average age of in university systems higher. How important is that? How are universities shifting to cater to that population? How do your companies maybe fit into that that equation? And I don't. You know, sir. Well, I, I will say quit one hugging. thing. And I, quit hugging, Laura. No, I, let them talk. <laughs> one, one, one thing I would just just say on um, on that is, if you listen to, for example, Dr. Christian, the Chancellor of the California Community College System, you know there may be 1.6 million high school students, but she's like, there's 10 million total that we can get into the community colleges to activate workforce capabilities and and really be much more diverse and inclusive of how to do that. And, that, and that's where technology will play a role. But I'd love to hear the other panels. Look, um, I actually wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about another cohort of students, which is international students. Um, and Ashwin, I know you'll have some great examples here too, but the way I look at the opportunity is that I'm, like you, I'm quite bullish on, on the US um, education opportunity as it relates to international students. So there is a very strong starting point we know from survey results that from a quality perspective, the US is clearly ranked as the most preferred destination in terms of quality. When we have a look at what US universities can do to position themselves to be attractive to international students, there are opportunities around further creating that connection to employment and career outcomes. We know from our research that two thirds of international students care deeply uh, about access to career opportunities at the other end. So the US could look to examples in terms of what's been done in Australia and Canada in terms of access to post-study work rights and how that supports the growth in international education. The other thing that I think is a great opportunity is to get behind and we're really leading a drive towards a national, international education export strategy. So the US, whilst it is a very popular destination, is the only destination amongst English speaking markets that does not have an international education export strategy. And what we can see from the UNESCO data is this has led to international student growth rates being much lower in the US compared to these other markets. So a cohesive, united strategy will give the US the opportunity to position as the destination of choice, as well as creating a welcoming community for international students to come in. So I think there's a great opportunity. There's clear next steps that can be taken, but starting with a really strong starting point. Uh, let me maybe start with the value of the degree question first. Uh, in the US, gross enrollment uh, ratio is about 80%, 86%. And so we can sit here and maybe debate the value of the degree. Come to India, gross enrollment ratio is 27 to 30%. It's always a range because data is a little fudgy. And nobody's debating the value of the degree. In fact, there are 600 million Indians who are below the age of 30. Uh, and the entrance to get into a top IIT or an IIM, the selectivity is like 0.2%. It's tougher to get into an IIT or an IIM than it is to a Harvard or an MIT. And so the perspective, I think the further you go from the home campus, I think more the value of that brand and that education um, is, um, is perceptible. And to your point, actually, last year we had in, in India the largest number of students actually coming to study abroad, nearly a million students. So they still value that, uh, that degree. But to your second question on you know, non-traditional learners, you know, at Emeritus we spend a lot, of, a lot of our time working with high quality, not-for-profit institutions and attracting learners to their programs who otherwise won't be able to come to campus programs, predominantly in the non-degree space. Um, 
I would say we're, you know, last 12 months, we touched the lives of maybe 250,000 students, but it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, and even, by the way, I contradict myself a little bit from my first statement, say even in markets like India, Southeast Asia, China, there is a growing awareness that the skills you learn is more important than just the degree that you have. That's awareness in companies as well as in individuals. And I think also to what Tennessee said, the US institution, if I compare and contrast with say UK or Australia, the higher education institutions in the UK and Australia are far more international in their outlook of A, how do I attract more students from India, Southeast Asia to our campus, but also how do I go to them, whether that's through online, whether that's setting up campuses, whether it's pathways, collaborations. And I think that is maybe a lesson um, that US universities can think of imbi imbibing or replicating. Can I go? Yes. Thanks. The, uh, so um, the thing that I thought about, right, is a lot of times we like to think in dichotomies, right? We, we, we like to think it's either a degree or it's skills, right? And, and it's not the either, it's, they're not ors, right? And, and I think what the opportunity is, particularly for universities and, and, and higher ed systems, is um, we can, you know, the transcript is still really important. In fact, even those companies that put a lot of emphasis on skills training, still most of their job you know uh, postings require a degree so it's not i don't you know i don't believe this is is a, is we're going to go away from degrees but you can have a much richer uh, understanding inside of that transcript about what you know what was accomplished what you know is there a portfolio that demonstrates what was actually learned and shows some of the work and those types of things and so i do think there's an opportunity here to not think in in either ors but let's think about and when it comes to these types of students. Well, and that maybe, how are universities thinking about this? Because, you know, the ability to pull in credentials, professional certificates into the learning pathways for credit, is that becoming a bigger priority? You know, I think there could be some benefits to the employability of that learner the, when, once they earn the degree, but then also the cost side of the equation. Um, if, you're, if you're giving that, con, you know, if you have those pathways that include professional certificates, et cetera, could be lower cost than having Professor, uh, professor teaching a course, et cetera. So how do you see universities thinking about that concept? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from, from our experience is um, there's still a, a bit of a, um, there still is a bit of a separation between those two um, um, efforts, I think, within, within universities. I think more and more the kind of the early adopters, the forward-thinking universities are starting to tr try to meld those two together as far as, um, you know, I got this faculty for on per, uh, you know, in person. I've got this separate organization that's dealing with, you know, how do I do non-traditional and things like that. Um, you know, the uh, I think, you know, frankly, in the the universities that I talk to, they're they're just trying to figure out how do I get more students, right? It's 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 more about how do we how do we increase enrollments, uh, and um, and then the next thing they're going to worry about is is this helping me from a cost perspective or things like that. But let's let's get enrollments up. I don't know if, if that's what well, you're seeing. No, I, we see a lot, and it's definitely getting enrollments up, but now it's like, what are the outcomes? And you see entire systems, like the North Carolina Community College System, is working to change the funding, not just about getting enrollment up and graduating, but graduating students with requisite skill sets, tying it directly to where the workforce needs are across the state. And so I think that will be very data-driven um, to, to make sure the state is funding education the right ways. It will also help um, retain students because it'll be more prescriptive. What are the what are the skill sets that you need to do that? So we just we just announced a, a new cap, uh, a new solution called Journey, which helps students, which uses AI. So this is where we're really doubling down on AI. It uses AI to pull all of the student record in from what they're doing and the the from the courses and the degree planning and the tour degree w works, and then it's looking and it's taking all that data and saying, what are the skill sets that students get when they take these courses? What are they bringing in? And packaging that in a way that traditionally they graduate, and I have a degree in X, what do the jobs look like? But this then maps the skill sets directly to the workforce needs. So I think whether it's a community college, whether it's reskilling or traditional student, there's gonna be a whole new landscape of what are my capabilities and skill sets and tying that to jobs. And there are many great uh, organizations out there t with the workforce data, like Burning Glass Institute. So tying those outcomes into where are those jobs going? Because everyone's worried, hey, now AI is getting rid of a lot of jobs. We know with every innovation, a AI, whatever it was, there's gonna be new jobs created. So the skill sets needed are what employers like, like 
both of us are looking for, right? The skill sets. Degrees really matter, but then you need to know what are the skill sets that, that will help me land that job. So many more institutions are thinking about this and, and looking at what is, where's my technology going to be more inclusive for the students. Um, maybe you wanted to, to quickly hit on content sharing because I, I think we've seen at least some growth in content sharing among universities, um, you know, taking best of breed courses, maybe leveraging that or, or, or selling it out to other universities. Is that a concept you guys have seen pick up at all? Um, I don't know if there's, if there's, yeah, I don't know, Steve, if. You know, I, not, not in mass. I've uh, seen, uh, you know, for me, that one's a tough one if I'm a university, right? It would be like me saying I'm gonna con I'm con content share my IP, right, with with Laura, and then that'll never happen. Would do that, right? Never, no. <laughs> ever. But uh, but you, so so I don't I don't know that that necessarily is the um, the wave of the future. I don't I don't feel like I, I we don't we don't see it a lot with our with our um, with our partners. But um, yeah, that one's a hard one for me. We've actually seen universities not want to share content with other parts of the same university. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. at, this, at the same time, if you have systems, um, the, the most important thing is within a system and how the funding works, uh, how do you make sure that students can consume from any, in, any of the, any community college? So we, we build in cross-registration that will go across the system um, formally. So they say, hey, I can complete a certification degree, but my college, my university doesn't have that program. How do I consume that online everywhere? So a, an, a, a student is recognized by the entire system uh, from a system office, and then they can actually register for courses. So that, that's very important is economies of scale or rural colleges that don't have some of the, the, the um, courses that are needed for a student to achieve what they need to. So that, that's where the technology can help. But I would, I would agree openly. They don't, they're very proprietary, right? They want to hug what they believe is best in class and, and not even share it across the same college. So very interesting. You see that in other markets? I'm curious if... Uh, look, from no, we don't see it widely. I, I think in in the same way that has been spoken about, currently it's viewed as IP, and and something that is yeah protected quite well. Got it. Um, so maybe you wanted to maybe Tanil wanted to dig in with you a little bit more, and I think you talked about this a little bit, but just as we think about, especially U.S. universities being able to open their doors to more international learners. You know, you talked about some of the, the, I guess, some of the policies that maybe maybe need to, or programs that need to be put in place. But what what are some of the the, the barriers that you see? What what do U.S. universities do you think need to do to cater to that? And how how big of an initiative is that for U.S. universities, governments, as we think about workforce expansion, things like that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So there's probably two main headings that I would think about with the conversations I've had with US universities. Firstly, uh, the importance as they're thinking about their international student cohort of global reach. And so consistently we hear that what is important for US universities is to be able to find quality students, diversity of students at the volumes that they're looking for. And that is very difficult to do for one university thinking about the, the global footprint that exists. Uh, I think there are opportunities to work with strategic partners to support those efforts. And so finding those right strategic partners that can get you access to the right student who is looking to study in your destination, at your institution, and will be a quality student that goes through to uh, completion is what everyone's looking for. So I think that global reach point is very important. The second point that we hear um, from both prospective students, in particular coming from developing markets like Sub-Sahara Africa, like Latin America, like um, South Asia and other regions, is there would be so much value that would come from bringing clarity and transparency around visa processing um, and and criteria around visa processing. So I think bringing transparency to the process itself, how it works and what are the criteria would go a long way to ensuring that prospective students feel uh, welcomed as they come into, into the country. Uh, maybe going to move to, I, and I don't even know if you guys are going to respond to this question at all, but as we think about the OPM model, um, there have clearly been a lot of shifts there as we think about the last couple years. What do you think happens? Um, do you view it as potentially an opportunity? If universities are going to handle more internally, 
is there an opportunity to provide more support to the uni university system as you think about your company solutions? And maybe I'll start with Steve. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so I've always, I've used the, um, you know, the parallel for me is that OPMs came into existence because universities didn't know how to reach us um, in, in our homes, right, and remotely and, and, and do that. Um, very similar to the way the studios didn't know how to reach us in our homes, and so they would get in these rev share agreements with Netflix, right? But ultimately, you know, I think, and I don't, we're not there yet, but I, the, bigger, the bigger schools that we work with, the R1s, a lot of them are taking, taking now that back. They want to be Disney Plus, right? They want to go directly to the, to the um, consumer uh, of, of education, uh, and they're looking for partners that can provide that, a lot of different pieces of that, whether it's a tech stack or, um, or you know, uh, uh, recruitment, those types of things. So I, th I think ultimately, uh, but smaller, smaller, smaller schools are still using OPMs in mass, right? But but I do believe it's going to de kind of um, uh, decompose. It's going to come into the different pieces. I think the OPMs become a resource, um, particularly maybe think of them. I think of them as like SEO type um, organizations to help help recruit and find those students and bring them in. So the promise of OPMs maybe ten years back to universities was that we'll get you students from you know, far away places who will not be able to come to your campuses. And then what really transpired is that 70% <clears throat> of the students live in the same state or within, and there's somebody did a study within a 100 mile radius, right? Um, we actually flipped that. At Emeritus, about 70% of the students that we bring uh, to a university is actually outside of their, of their country. This is specific for US and UK university. It's tougher to do that in India or LATAM. And I think uh, institutions value that and it's difficult for them to do it themselves, right? Because think about you know, your course being delivered now in Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin. Think about reaching students in those markets who if, you're don't, if you don't WeChat with them or WhatsApp them, they won't convert. Students, for example, in Southeast Asia, Latin America, you need to speak with them. They want financing options that's local, right? That are tax issues. And so as universities think about attracting students from across the world, um, having a partner that adds capabilities that they don't have themselves is going to be an essential part of that strategy. Look, I truly believe that it's going to be a portfolio. Universities should do a bunch of online stuff themselves and maybe uh, serving students in, in their local market, maybe degree programs, et cetera. That's probably a good option. But they should also experiment with partners who have reach in areas where it will be very difficult for them to replicate. And it has to be that hybrid approach. Uh, and just as since you mentioned the word OPM, I think from somebody who provides those services, I think they have to really understand that universities were here 100, 200 years ago. They will be 100, 200 years from now. And so you have to work with these universities and students with a value system that's enduring. And if you try to take shortcuts, then unfortunately the whole landscape gets painted in a brush that is not very conducive. That's very helpful. Wanted to then shift to, you know, you got thinking about the learner life cycle. You know, you've got, you know, when you think about your companies and, and catering a little bit towards the higher education ecosystem, how important is it for those universities to get touch points earlier in the learner life cycle, thinking about down to high school, thinking about then helping support them as they move into the, you know, the workforce? How important is that for universities? How do your company solutions maybe fit into that? Let me start. Yeah, so hugely important and a big part of our strategy um, as the, you know, from our perspective, Canvas is the leading, um, has a leading market share in K-12 and in higher ed. I think um, what it becomes incumbent on us, it's a responsibility that we have to help ease those transition points, right? The areas, you know, I was meeting with the Board of Regents in Louisiana and they're actually trying to figure out how they can get funding to get uh, anybody that's doing dual enrollment, they can get free credit for those for those classes that they take while they're still in in high school as a way to to, to kind of grease the skids at any of these uh, transition points. And so, uh, I believe one, it's a key key part of our strategy to help in that process. Um, and we do a lot of things um, like uh, like Laura talked about with. Uh, you know how do you how do you now help them be more mobile in that whole learning process? Um, but it is a it's a key part of the strategy. But it also, I think it's a key responsibility if we want to uh, enable that whole learning journey, uh, regardless of how they decide to go. You know, as a um, 
most of our uh, customers, the majority are still in North America. But if you look at the global marketplace, it's wonderful because you often have ministers of education. So they think, you know, in the in the Deborah Quazo and ASU cradle to gray, right? They they think about the whole ecosystem. We're very choppy in the U.S. And one of the things I believe is that higher education sits at the at the at a very um, important center of everything where we should be able to connect the data of the student journey from the beginning and understand what creates success all along the way. So when you connect all of that data, um, which we do with, with, with many different organizations, power school or, you know, instru in, in structures connected to the K through 12 as well, we can actually see what a, what a learner journey looks like for life through higher education, we can look back and say, what made those students successful? How do we sort of curate learning in new ways? So we're very bullish on surfacing up the data on the full learner, learner journey so a minister, a governor can see how are our students doing? What stunts their opportunities in, in getting into STEM fields? What, in, what schools do well? How do we replicate the successes so that there's a, a better ROI for the taxpayer dollars that go into education all along the way, and I think the most powerful thing is you don't really see all the student student data holistically. You can have reports that go back and forth, but in most states, it's it's months and months and months. But if you can see real time student data, that's very powerful to understand how do you personalize learning, how do you make sure that you're funding the right programs, what does curricula look like in the future, how do students best learn, because the future of learning should be personalized for life, and we're not there yet, and I think this is where higher education sits in the middle to look back and to help shape the future into the workforce, and it's all about getting the access to the data. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring a slightly different perspective. Um, we we operate more at the, the start of the cycle, the top of the funnel, um, and again, we focus on international students. And so the complexity that is involved in all of the steps an international student has to take before they arrive on the doorstep of a US institution ready to study is phenomenal. So it's typically a 12 to 24 month journey, and there are steps involved, you touched on those, working through everything in terms of how I secure financing, how I secure a visa, how I sit my English language proficiency test. This is a multi-year, multi-step process. Uh, we are working with hundreds of thousands of students throughout that two-year journey um, in both a digital way but also with deep human connection. That gives us a very unique perspective on the top of the funnel and what the pipeline looks like and what demand looks like one to two years before students actually arrive. One of the ways that we work with our university partners strategically is to partner with them in providing access to that data and those insights to help them form a very clear view of where future student trends are, where future pipeline is, where future demand is to help them think through how they attract those types of students. So we've got a lot of focus on the top of the funnel and how we can leverage the data and insights that come from our scale to support our US university partners. Increasingly, um, as everyone in the room knows, higher education is an important step towards a career outcome for a lifelong learner. And so the utopia is that we continue to find a way to connect all the great work that people in this room are doing in the higher education space to the career outcome that these students are looking for. The work that we are doing is seeking to br bring that career information right up front right up into their initial decision-making process so we can be confident that a student has chosen the right course at the right institution for them to achieve their career outcomes. And so I think work that universities can do in parallel with their strategic partners to create that end-to-end -end view of the customer, including what they want to achieve from a career perspective, will be where we really unlock value for students. I think that's really important, but so many students don't know what they want yet. So getting getting them on track the right way, but then having agility for students to say, I thought I wanted to be to be a doctor, but actually I just want to be in, in healthcare technology. So I think it's important to set them up for success, but at least 50% of students like change their mind all along the way, or they, they're undeclared for 50% for of their, um, their track. So that's where I think the institutions need to have a lot of agility to be able to pivot. Now, I, w I imagine it's harder for international students because they have a focus, they may go to a certain institution, and they, they may just be more successful um, because they're more purposeful and they've been spending a couple years figuring out where they want to go. 
I do think U.S. institutions, when you think about the enrollment cliff, the smartest ones are thinking about how do we use technology like an apply board to attract international and give them like, hey, you're in right away, uh, real time, which is what they're doing. So that's exciting because most institutions, they have a way of recruiting international students, but it's not all that strategic and purposeful. And there are a lot of great partners like you that are helping them fill the gap. And I think just creating more opportunity to have a more diverse population at any institution of any size is just a good thing. So it's, it's definitely where U.S. institutions need to improve. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm gonna do some quick hitters here. Um, mandatory AI question, and, and I guess you can answer this from the perspective of either your company or just thinking about the broader industry. You know, relative to where, you know, where we are now, relative to where we would have thought last year, how far along are we in terms of leveraging the capability? Are we moving faster or slower than you would have expected? I don't know, do you wanna start? Let me start. Sure. Um, I'd say uh, kind of where we expected. I think uh, the technology is moving a lot faster than the adoption, for sure, a and the um, the willingness to adopt. Even um, there, there's a there's a certain amount of caution within the education system as far as how do we use this in a responsible way. Are universities getting more comfortable with the thought? Yeah, I, I think when it first came out, it was this is just a cheating tool, right? And and we're gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna shut this we're gonna shut this crap down. <laughs> Right, but the um, yeah, it's now they're seeing that, that there there is a benefit, and 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 at one point there was a, a belief that it was going to re potentially replace teachers, right? And and I think we're they're starting to recognize just as you know maybe augmented reality, it's, it's a way to, to actually make them superhuman. Looking from a slightly different perspective, we offer a bunch of AI courses with universities. Over the last twelve months, those have grown five x. Right, so somebody is clearly interested in learning about AI. I think the broader education industry is always a slower adopter, but the people buying our services are clearly interested in AI. Consumers are moving faster. Yep. Um, maybe then you know you're and you're publicly traded, so we already know the answer to this question. But balance of growth versus profitability. I'd, I'd love to hear how you guys are thinking about being able to make strategic growth initiatives versus letting the profitability ramp more. I mean, and I guess, you know, you guys are public as well. So uh, maybe I'll ask this to Laura and, and, uh, to, Laura and, and to uh, Ashwin. Ashwin. Uh, it's simple for me, both. We do both. We, we have a growth strategy that's aligned to the investment thesis of our partners, Blackstone and Vista, and we drive profitability in uh, how we operate in efficiencies and focus on the market. So you got to do both at the same time. Now, we're lucky because, you know, you'll say, hey, how fast do we need to grow EBITDA? And oftentimes we, um, you know, we are given the f enough freedom to take some of the profits and grow, grow faster against our strategy, but it's never one or the other. So that's the easy answer. But the question you had was slightly different. It's just what the is true one. <laughs> True and easy, but the question you had is, what if you can't do both? Which one would you pick? Maybe, uh, maybe. That's, a, that's a better question. <laughs> so, look, I would love to say we would love to grow profitably, but there are trade-offs to be made. Uh, I think we're at a, I mean, for at least venture-backed, private equity-backed companies, we're at a stage uh, where I think profitability is being valued more. But if I look forward five, ten years, I always think... Uh, growth is perhaps a little more important, right? Now, maybe that's counterintuitive, and I know that some people will not agree with this. Not at the cost of profitability, but let me frame it this way. The rule of 40. Would you rather grow 20% and be at 20% EBITDA, or would you rather grow 30% and be at 10% EBITDA now, but that difference is because you're investing in future growth? I would choose the latter, right? Um, but that is just me. There is no right answer. There are multiple. Yeah. I think one of the things um, that maybe is underappreciated by management teams within software companies is that your all your profitability comes from your install base, right? And so, your your ability. So when when you're when you're young, you have a small, you don't have a big install base, right? You're not going to make money because it's more expensive to go get those customers. But but what what I see what I see companies make the mistake is is as they start to get an installed base, they still treat them as if they're new logo part of their business. And so they're investing as if that installed, but you know, they, they're, they're paying all their salespeople for, for, you know, a renewal and not, not on new business. There's, there's a bunch of things that software companies tend to do that, that they under, um, under leverage their ability to get profitable quicker. 
under the belief that I'm just going to plow money back into the business to keep growing. Yeah, and th I think that's a good point. When I was at, as an example at Oracle, um, I worked for Mark Hurd, uh, rest in peace, but a lot of what Oracle did was when you're, when you're a market leader and you have an install base, and that's where I am, then you leverage your install base and your maintenance um, profitability to drive new growth. That's why you can do both. So at Oracle, they would buy companies, many of them were on-prem, they would use the maintenance revenues to accelerate their transformational growth. And that's how, if you're a larger company, you can do that. If you're a smaller company and you're just getting an install base, it's really hard. And I would focus on the growth, right? Because you want to take market, have a, have a, have a very strategic uh, focus on your solutions, drive that growth. And that's the area of venture capital where you're gonna you're gonna not be you you're not gonna be profitable for a long time. Look at Salesforce; they weren't profitable for a long time, but they're they're a giant now. They went into the market and they grew, 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 and and then they became profitable. Yeah, I think that's it's right. Timing. It's it's timing. It's where you're in the life cycle. We're in a privileged position. We're a 50 year old uh, company um, in the edtech space, relatively unusual in being both high growth and highly profitable. EBITDA margin sitting at 20 plus percent. The non-negotiable is discipline on your costs to allow you to reinvest, align Absolutely. to your strategy, Absolutely. to be able to deliver sustainable, profitable growth. So, as absolutely, the aspiration is both. Where you are in your life cycle does depend where you take the decision that you just spoke about, but the non-negotiable as we navigate this is a disciplined approach to cost, number one, and absolute clarity on your strategy and where you will invest. There's always too many priorities, too many opportunities, but being very clear on who your company is, what it stands for, and where you will make a difference, that means you'll spend your dollars in, in the best place. And by the way, our, our industry deserves companies that know how to make money and will be around for generations, right? Because they're so, they're, they are generational businesses, right? It's, it's, this isn't a flash in the pan. We're too littered with companies that didn't, didn't make the pivot at the right time right? and start focusing on, on, um, on making money. And we need to be around for 30, 50, 60, 70 years because that's, that's the kind of problems that our, our customers are trying to solve. How, how old is Instructure, you guys? We're like 15. Yeah, 15. We're over, we're over 50 years. So we were SCT, Data Tell SunGuard coming together. Higher education is all we do. So, you know, sometimes in, in higher education, you know, VC, private equity is kind of scary. Um, but you have to look at the, the staying power and the resiliency and the investments that have made, made along the way. And we're now fortunate to have partners that are on 10-year, longer-term investments, which is why we can drive growth and profitability. And that's important to the community because we need to be around. I wake up and say like, hey, can't screw this up because this is infrastructure for higher education. And the infrastructure that we're creating is to make sure there's an open SaaS platform so that innovation can happen and the platform and connect and integrate. So all of the, the, the venture-backed companies have a place with the integrations that's very powerful because I'm not building it all. There are great companies like yours that are building it. Just to clarify, we are profitable and growing. <laughs> See, you're both. <laughs> but you would take growth first. Profitable first? So, but the example I gave, right, would I rather grow 30% at a 10% EBIT, or I'll grow 20%, maybe at a 15% EBIT? In that trade-off, the trade-off is not would I rather grow faster and be unprofitable. We all have to be sustainable. I think that we, we understand. And we are at a stage also, I don't know whether we are, will consider ourselves early stage. We are getting next year to be about 600 million in top line, profitable, probably 10% you know, EBITDA uh, margins. But I would love to see if we could grow faster because then I, that means we can generate more revenue to our not-for-profit universities who can then go and use that money to do research, attract other students that we may not be able to serve. It also perhaps is a reflection of the markets that we play in, right? You look at Latin America, India, Southeast Asia. In India, there are 40 million students in higher education today, but that's only 27% gross enrollment. Um, that, so you know, if I just look at that one market, a Southeast Asia, the kind of growth that we are seeing there is, is phenomenal in terms of demographics. Right? So again, we look at this in di different ways. I don't think we're saying fundamentally different things, but perhaps perspective from where we look at things may be slightly different. That's helpful. Well, I think we are out of time. Thank you so much to our panelists. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here.